Hello, everyone, and thank you all so much for joining us online this evening to, to talk about rhinos and specifically about black rhino conservation in Zimbabwe. We're going to kick off with a series of presentations and then there'll be an opportunity for all of you to ask questions at the end. So please drop your questions into the chat box on Zoom or into the comments on Facebook as we go, and I'll put those to our presenters at the end. It'd be great to connect with you all then. Also, just to note to you that although we are focusing on rhino successes today, we do have a couple of graphic images where animals have been injured just as part of being true to telling their stories. It's really particularly exciting for me to be welcoming you tonight in my new role as CEO here at Save the Rhino. It really is such an honor for me to have the opportunity to work with this wonderful organization and fantastic group of people and partners. This evening, I'm joined by two colleagues from Low Park Rhino Trust in Zimbabwe. Raul de Toy is joining us from Harare. He's the director of the Low Park Rhino Trust and international advisor to the International Rhino Foundation. Raul's involvement with rhinos began with his appointment in 1985 as scientific officer to the then IUCN African Elephant and Rhino Specialist Group. He worked for WWF on several rhino projects in Africa, including a project to establish large rhino conservancies in Southern Zimbabwe. Raoul was awarded the Sir Peter Scott Award by the IUCN Species Survival Commission in 2009 and the Goldman Environmental Prize for Africa in 2011. And Raoul's recognized as one of Africa's most influential African rhino conservationists. We're also joined by Natasha Anderson, who's joining us from her office out in the field in Booby Valley Conservancy. Natasha is the IRF Zimbabwe Rhino Monitoring Manager and Monitoring Coordinator for the Low Felt Rhino Trust. Natasha was born in Australia. She first arrived in Zimbabwe in 1996 as a volunteer after completing her Master's in Environmental Studies at the University of Melbourne. She's been based in the Southeast Low Felt throughout her whole 27 years in Zimbabwe, where she's involved with managing the education program for Low Felt Rhino Trust and coordinates the monitoring of the large rhino population in Booby Valley Conservancies. Um, I feel very fortunate to have known and worked with Raoul and Natasha for many years as part of the IUCN African Rhino Specialist Group. And it's really special for me to be able to share my first event here at Save the Rhino with them. Um, I know we seem to be having a few echoes still in comments in the chat. Um, I just want to check whether there are any technical glitches we need to look at here. The sound seems okay this side. No, I don't Great. have any echo. Great. Oh, but I do when I speak. Hmm. So as as this picture reveals, some of you in the audience may already know that this is not, in fact, my first experience with Save the Rhino. I actually really began my rhino conservation career here in the summer of 1997. About 25 years ago, during my last year at University of London, I saw a poster in a shop window advertising a talk at the Royal Geographical Society by David Sterling and, and Johnny Roberts about the trip they'd taken on motorbikes from London to Cape Town, um, during which they uh, came across a wide range of rhino conservation projects and that sparked their inception of Save the Rhino when they got back to the UK. I went along to this talk and I was so inspired by the organization, I signed up as a volunteer. After two years of that, I was appointed as office manager in the original Save the Rhino offices in, in Winchester Wharf and promoted to the role of projects manager. Um, and of course, this being Save the Rhino, it also required me to take on a number of marathon and other challenges involving rhino costumes along the way. In early 2001, I left Save the Rhino to move to South Africa for my postgraduate studies in conservation science. And I remained there for the next 22 years until I moved back to London just last month um, to rejoin the organization. But in fact, my personal connection to rhinos goes back even further. Um, 
1994, where I spent some time during my gap year after my A-levels as a volunteer on a rally international project in Zimbabwe. As part of the um, experience, we spent time in Savi Valley Conservancy in the Zimbabwe Lofal, where we assisted with data collection for an ecology survey. We were camping out and walking between a series of GPS points. One Sunday afternoon, uh, four of us decided to, to take the time out and sit near a waterhole and see if we could spot any animals coming down to drink. We didn't see very much, and as the sun began to drop, we started walking back up towards the camp. And then we were very surprised to spot a black rhino in the distance coming down the track towards us. So as a group of young Brits, we really weren't sure how to handle this situation. And we just huddled together in the bushes at the side of the track, hoping that the rhino would just walk past us down to the water hole. Instead, he also stopped in the bushes about 30 meters from us. And the four of us were looking at each other with very big eyes, nothing in our childhoods in the UK had prepared for this. Time went on, the light was starting to fade. We just didn't know what to do next. So eventually we managed to communicate to each other in, in sign language and whispers that on the count of three, we would all run off together into the bush away from the rhino. Now, of course, I know now this was not the wisest approach. However, on the count of three, we all leapt up and crashed off, meaning the poor rhino got a huge surprise and he was huffing around in the background, snorting at all the disturbance we'd created with our foolishness. That, as you can probably imagine, was a huge adrenaline rush. And the staff we were making with, we were working with on the reserve had also made us very aware of the threats that black rhinos were facing at that time. Numbers across the continent had dropped to their, actually what was their lowest ever, to less than two and a half thousand. And later on the trip, we discovered this old rhino carcass, which had been overgrown with grass. It was hidden deep in thick bush, um, the reserve staff came and checked it out. They, they couldn't pick up any bullets with the metal detector, but the horns of the carcass were never found. And that moment of pure rhino adrenaline combined with this growing understanding of the way that these magnificent animals were being poached to ever lower numbers just ignited my passion for rhinos and changed the course of my life. So the part of southern Zimbabwe we were working in has very diverse vegetation types, lots of rocky outcrops and hills. It's a really beautiful place. It was a really beautiful place to be working. And it was also a really important time and place for rhino conservation in Zimbabwe. Historically, this had been a very rich area for wildlife and then had been converted into cattle farms. By the 1980s, cattle farming was much less financially viable. In 91, there was a major drought. And at this time, people were starting to move black rhino out of areas at which they were at higher risk in, into these new areas. And the introduction of black rhino into this area was the impetus for the creation of the Savi Valley Conservancy. The landowners of the 18 different former, former cattle ranches joined together, removed their cattle, dropped internal fences and created this huge new wildlife conservancy. Um, and, and we'll be hearing more from Raoul later today um, about this work in this area. But of course, over time, the, the change in land use from wildlife to cattle had changed the vegetation. And so the amount of vegetation, of, of the amount and diversity of food resources that were available for wildlife. And with the removal of cattle and the conversion back to wildlife, it would be expected to change again. So our project was collecting information on trees, grasses, and soil samples so that we could set the baseline for vegetation monitoring to understand how the plants in the area recovered. And I think my early exposure to the importance of these dynamics between food resources and, and wildlife populations really helped set the scene for um, a lot of my later doctoral research looking um, at conservation ecology for, for black climate population management. So if we come back to the present day, um, today we're hearing from our colleagues at Lofot Rhino Trust. Uh, Lofot Rhino Trust is very closely associated with the International Rhino Foundation in the US. 
And both of these organizations are long-term friends of Save the Rhino. So there's been great teamwork between our organizations for many years. Um, actually, the first grant from Save the Rhino was made uh, to LRT, to Lofot Rhino Trust in May 2003. And in the past year and a half alone, we've been able to provide over 85,000 pounds of support to LRT to enable them to undertake the work you'll be learning about today. Um, this includes the work by their rhino monitoring team, who you can see here, um, their operational costs, as well as the low fault rhino law enforcement task force, um, operations and, and their vehicle. And this in turn is thanks to all of our supporters, including the, the International Rhino Foundation, our friends at Dublin Zoo, Scott and Jessica McClintock Foundation, the Animates Rhino Trust, and many generous contributions from our individual donors to Save the Rhino, some of whom I'm very pleased to see here on the call today. So with all that said, I'll hand you over now to, to Raoul and Natasha to hear all about their work. Over to you, Al. I've got a jam. Sorry, for some reason, this is not moving on. Um, no, it's jammed on the slide. <laughs> um, let me see what I can do. Uh, if necessary, Al, you can close yours and I can project it, if that will help. I think you better, Joe. Um, no problem. Oh, can you share? Sorry, everybody, just bear with us two seconds. Slight technical hitch here across the across the continent. We'll be with you any second. Let me just try once more while you keep finding your. Sure. Okay, is that showing? It is. Okay. Thanks very much, everybody. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, we're going to try and give you a bit of an overview of um, what we feel is really important in rhino conservation and what we in the Lowport Rhino Trust have been trying to achieve for quite a long time uh, with the tremendous support we've had from Save the Rhino and other organizations. Um, really, what the message we're going to try and uh, get over is that every rhino counts, but the counting of those rhinos has to be towards establishing viable populations of rhinos. Um, we need individual rhinos added together to create much larger populations because adding a few individual rhinos together to create small groups of rhinos is not going to cut it in terms of long-term rhino conservation. So our emphasis is and always has been on leaving no rhino behind in order to amalgamate these rhinos into large viable populations. And once again, I've got a screen sticking. So there we go. Um, so in that context, obviously, every birth counts. That's what we look at primarily is what we're getting in terms of reproduction. That's pretty obvious. Um, but um, it's very important to ensure that these births are happening by making, uh, bringing the rhino reproductive parameters to their optimum, which means minimum ages of first calving, means minimum uh, minimum intercalving intervals between when one when a cow has a calf and her next calf, et cetera, and all that takes management. And then from there, you have to get the rhinos back in the wild. There's a lot of emphasis, obviously, on orphanages, et cetera, to do with the poaching crisis. But unless these rhinos are in the wild, interacting with other rhinos, exposed to natural selection pressures, and evolving and reproducing as a wild species, we're not really achieving what we need. So we put a lot of emphasis on making sure that when we do have to um, deal with orphan rhinos or rehabilitate rhinos, we do it in a way that allows them to get back into the wild, as my colleague Natasha will be explaining in more detail later. Every rhino rescue counts, um, and one has to sometimes go to quite extraordinary lengths to make sure that we do look for every rhino that is in need of, of recapturing either stray rhino or remnant rhino in an area that the others have been wiped out in and get that animal into a situation where it can um, have this interaction with other rhinos and get on with the breeding. Um, every injured rhino needs attending to. Uh, this is a rhino that's been injured by snares um, on both legs and 
went on to make a pretty full recovery. Once you get those snares off, um, provided it's the type of wire that doesn't create infection, which we'll discuss again later, these wounds can heal remarkably well in this rhino, can continue as a productive breeding animal in the population. Uh, there has, but, but in saying that one has to make sure that every rhino uh, is, is, every injured rhino is considered in terms of whatever plan needs to be made. We also have to be mindful that there's some situations where it's better just to monitor the rhino. In other words, not to implement uh, a darting operation, which involves a lot of stress on the animal. When these rhinos are drugged, they will collapse, um, sometimes in uneven terrain, into gullies, et cetera. They may collapse awkwardly on their legs. So we, we have to really assess whether we're going to do more harm than good by darting that rhino, chasing it with a helicopter, or even on the ground, um, and, and putting it through that stress. There are situations, because rhinos are heavy, heavily bodied, heavy-bodied animals where injuries to legs um, can, can easily get quite exacerbated. And here's an example of a rhino that was shot in its leg, and the, the arrow shows the path of the bullet that took off part of the, um, uh, the, the joint, and eventually this collapsed. That rhino went down. Another example is this bull here, one of the ones that was traumatically dehorned by poachers. Um, he was sprayed with a hail of AK bullets, and you can see he had a number of bullets in him. But instead of putting in a pen, we deemed it was better to leave him out in the wild, where he could get to his his brows and his water without the stress of, of, of being confined as a big wild bull into a pen. And he was actually recovering pretty well, despite these horrific injuries, um, until um, a photographer decided that they wanted to, he wanted to make a story about this. It actually became quite a famous story in National Geographic, and he insisted we weren't there at the time. We'd done our treatment and left the animal to quietly recover on its own, but he insisted on seeing it, was taken there by an idiot. Uh, the rhino then was approached in a clumsy way and, and charged them, and in the course of that charge, its scapula broke because it was already fragmented by a bullet or partly fragmented, and the animal had to be put down. So... The point I want to make about these recoveries of rhinos is one mustn't get into a total panic. It takes quite a lot of experience and assessment, and it's very important for the monitors to assess whether the rhino is getting to water, getting to bras, is defecating normally, is not getting hammered by other rhinos, and, and then make a plan from there. And we've had to do a lot of these in the hundreds of these kind of things. And by attending to every injured rhino, by capturing every rhino we can, by encouraging the births, we build up a population in which every percent of growth counts. And a number of you, I'm sure, um, are businessmen, you experienced with um, investments of one kind or another, and will know full well how with compound growth, every percent counts, every single percent. It's no good just keeping your population ticking along. You have to strive for every marginal increase that you can achieve in, in growth rate um, to get the compounding over a long period of time. And to give an example of the importance of that, here's a period of time when we had really heavy poaching in the low felt. And we look at the population that was actually achieved, the, the dotted line. But then if we look at what would have happened if we'd only had a 5% carving rate, and when I say only a 5% carving rate, we need to recognize that um, most conservation targets, most national rhino conservation strategies set a 5% biological growth rate as their target. But if we'd only achieved that target um, and, and then suffered the poaching that happened, the rhinos would have actually declined as shown by that solid red line, which mirrors what's actually happened in rhino populations in all other areas of Zimbabwe during that period. So like I said, every percent of growth counts, having rhinos in large settled populations in areas of, of good habitat where they're not socially, um, ecologically stressed uh, is critical. So we need to just discuss a bit, what, is, what, we, what do we mean by population viability? It's a term that often doesn't enter the discussion about rhino conservation, which is far more oriented towards short-term crisis management, et cetera. But what is long-term population viability? And there's a rule that conservation biologists have sort of come up with, which is a very rough and ready one, but gives an indication of the kind of orders of magnitude we're looking at. And according to that rule, we need about 50 rhinos or other large mammals of that type uh, in a 
interacting wild population to avoid avoid fairly short term and breeding problems. And, and those runners need to breed and grow as quickly as possible for reasons I'll explain just now. But to maintain long term evolutionary potential and to avoid a problem of what we call genetic drift, we need at least 500 rhinos, um, breeding rhinos, uh, to maintain evolutionary potential. And what we mean by genetic drift is this, this problem that we've got short term inbreeding, sure, we all know about that. But what we don't think about so much is that if you've got a relatively low rate of population growth, it's a bit like sampling alphabet soup from one bowl into another. There's a random selection. When a rhino is born, it's got a random selection of genetic material from one generation carried forward to the next generation. Uh, and then in turn, that's carried forward to, to the generation after that. And if you don't have much breeding, you're not going to be scooping up enough scoops of the, of the original genetic material, the original alphabet soup to carry forward to further generations. So it's critically important to have a high reproductive rate and not, not just think you're doing a great job of having a bunch of rhinos out there that are just ticking along, maybe not achieving a growth rate, but at least they're still alive. Well, the problem is they're not actually retaining the genetic diversity that they need to. So as the, uh, as the uh, conservation biologists say, there is un unfortunately a situation where we tend to, to look at short-term targets for um, rhino conservation. We very much influenced in the attainment of those targets and in, in our conservation strategies by, by political and financial constraints. And we often overlook the need for us to step back and look at what we're doing for the long term. We really need to go for numbers and we need to go for conservation science. And in doing that, there's an unfortunate reality, which is sorry, but 50 upon 500, that rule is, is, is too few. We need to think bigger than that. And that's because the population size may be in, we've got a certain number of rhinos in the population, but the number of those rhinos, the effective population size is actually breeding, is, is a much smaller proportion of the total population. And in, in, in many large mammals, it's, it's typically a, a tenth to a fifth of the total population size. So that means we need a lot more rhinos. And our challenge is how are we going to do this? Obviously, there's no area in Africa right now that probably under current poaching pressures, that's going to carry 5,000 rhinos. And that means we have to manage rhinos as what we call a metapopulation. We need to manage gene flow between individual subpopulations in a larger population. And people use the term metapopulation quite a lot. They just refer to the various populations of the country as a metapopulation. But they're not a metapopulation unless you've got a plan for managed gene flow between them, unless you're transferring rhinos around and maintaining that genetic diversity through through doing that, which is not so easy because rhinos can't be moved around like chess pieces over the landscape, as Natasha will explain later. They, the, the social interactions and the management issues associated with translocations of rhinos are quite complex. But ultimately, we've got to do this and we've got to build large populations and we've got to start looking at the biological value of the populations as a combination of various factors, the population size, the population growth rates that's being achieved, the inherent genetic diversity in that population, and come up with an index of biological value, which we can track over time, very much like one would track an investment in a stock market or the Dow Jones Industrial Index or something. What is actually happening in terms of the overall biological value of the rhinos in our portfolio? Um, in Save the Rhino International's portfolio of rhino investments, what is happening in terms of biological value of these animals, taking those conservation biology criteria into account? And we need to allocate funding towards that. And of course, we appreciate that a lot of the funding comes from um, small donors who are doing their very best to, to do something to help rhinos in the world. But even if it's small money, it's, it's a bit like the need to catch individual rhinos. The small money adds up, adds up, adds up. And provided it is targeted properly and used in a strategic way, it adds up to the big money that we need to in turn create big biological value. So that's really what we're trying to do. Our mission is to establish genetically viable populations in areas large enough to carry over 100 black rhinos in each area, knowing that, that even that's not enough in the long term, but by interacting, uh, by managing rhinos between these different populations, we're maintaining not only short-term genetic fitness, but also long-term um, adaptability.
Our project was originally set up under the World Wildlife Fund with funding provided by the Bike Trust, which is a small, low-profile UK-based trust that, that directs its support to um, Central Africa. And our support has primarily come from International Rhino Foundation and Save the Rhino International. And within that, I have to thank as well the US Fish and Wildlife Service for tremendous support by IRF and, and Dublin Zoo. I'd like to single out as a consistent form of, uh, source of support for us over a number of years via Save the Rhine International. Um, and all this, all this adds up to create the, um, what we need. We work in Southern Zimbabwe. Um, it's a hot, dry area. It's not as arid as Namibia, for instance, for those who know Namibia. There is, there is land use competition there because crops can be grown, although not always with very good yields. Um, so we do face land use challenges. Um, and that area now has 90% of Zimbabwe's rhinos, whereas in the early 1980s, almost all the rhinos were up in the top part of Zimbabwe on the other side of the central watershed um, and had to be moved for security uh, because of the cross-border poaching risk to southern Zimbabwe. So in southern Zimbabwe, we created these large conservancies that Joe mentioned by getting landowners to agree to convert from cattle production to wildlife production. Obviously, there were a lot of economic reasons for doing that. Um, you know, the climate change that we hear so much about now was even starting then, to be honest, and that combined with overgrazing and cattle management was making people realize that ecologically there had to be some change and a reversion to, to natural systems. So we built up these areas, um, and you can see there were a lot of translocations just singling out Bubiana Conservancy on the left there. By scavenging up these individual animals, making every rhino count, we built up an appreciable population that by mid-2002 in that Booby Valley Conservancy was 115 black rhinos. Um, but we then had land invasions starting in 2000 under a chaotic land reform program in Zimbabwe, which was really entirely politically motivated and paid little heed to the land use realities, where people moved into areas, cleared fields for short-term cultivation, and we had a massive conversion from what was former prime rhino habitat into cleared areas. Um, and the resident population, places like Bubiana Conservancy, were under a severe challenge. We then had to embark on another phase of consolidation of rhinos by scavenging rhinos again and moving them. And Booby Valley Conservancy then came into existence, um, which up until 2000 didn't have a single rhino in it but it was remained relatively secure for factors I won't go into now. There were various political uh, maneuvers and negotiations that took place that, that the landowners in Booby Valley handled very sensibly and, uh, and managed to retain quite a large amount of land while at the same time giving up for some resettlement um, and created a much more secure situation that we had elsewhere. So we introduced a total of 141 black rhinos into Booby Valley, as I said, from none being there in, in 2000, and this population is now built up. Um, we do the monitoring there, and Natasha is in charge of the monitoring, and we also do the rhino management there. I'll hand over to Natasha now to, to talk through those activities. That'll make it easier, won't it? Yep. Um, can you hear me okay? Right. Okay. Yep. Um, even more, um, thank you for joining us this evening and for this time. Um, I'm going to talk to you about the, the monitoring and what some of the things that Rao was talking about on a broader picture um, at that individual rhino level. Um, so, so we run our uh, monitoring on an individual identification um, process, which means we know each of our rhinos individually. Um, our guys do that by setting out, we have a small team of men that work primarily on spore tracking. So they will go out in the mornings, very early in the mornings, and pick up fresh spore um, footprints of the rhino. And they will follow those footprints until they get to actually see the rhino visual, um, take photos, they've got digital cameras, they'll record the location of where they've seen the rhino, they'll record other things like what was the rhino eating as they, they tracked it, what is its behavior, um, was it with any other rhinos, and they'll record the identity of the rhino. Now we're able to identify our rhino because we have a system of notching them. You'll see on this rhino's ear, she's got a hole in that right ear. She's also got another notch at the bottom of that ear. And on the top of her right ear, 
she has a, a notch in that in the top of that ear as well. And in our system, that adds up to 115. And because she's a female, she gets the number 2,000 allocated. The boys get 1,000s. And so that makes her, her national identification number 2,115. But to us, she's known as CD. CD is a, a, a lovely rhino. Her, her mother's name was Disco. Her daughter's names are iPod, Live Show, and LP, like the long playing record. Um, she's, she's a very popular rhino. Um, very, guys are very fond of her because she's a very relaxed rhino um, and lets you take photos like this, which you would normally not get the opportunity to do with many other rhinos. She's very chilled, um, whereas normally black rhinos will either run away or come for you quite quickly, and you don't want to be standing out in the open like um, this guy is. We maintain the ability to identify each of these rhinos individually by running annual ear notching operations. We try and notch the calves before they leave their mothers, which is normally at about two, two and a half years old. So we have to run two operations a year. Those operations have been generously, very generously supported by US Fish and Wildlife for many, many years now. Um, they're not cheap operations. We have overhead aircraft, fixed wing aircraft, which help the trackers locate the target animals. The darting is the drug immobilizations are done from a helicopter, which is expensive machinery, but it makes the operations much faster and much safer for the, for the animals. And by, by being able to keep track of, of them and notch them before they leave their mothers, we're definite in their identity. And then we're definite about the individuals in our population. And we don't end up in a situation where we've got lots of unnotched animals running around and um, and then you can start confusing individuals and either overcounting or undercounting. Um, so we, we know all of the animals in our population very well. And that gives us not just the, uh, the numbers, but also the demographics. And it's also helped us learn a lot about the social interactions of the rhinos, because we know who is interacting with who. Um, and, and it's not just, oh, we saw two rhinos together. It, it must be a bull and a, and a cow mating. Um, often, you know, it turns out it can be other combinations that you're only able to learn about when you're actually seeing them as, um, and know them as individuals. And having all of this information gives us what we need to be able to make the right management actions when they're appropriate. I've, I've got a little bit of a delay in the slides, but I'll, I'll start this. This rhino in the next photos that um, will be coming up is Sia Bua. She's one of the original 37 um, founders that were put into Bubiana Conservancy back in 1992. Um, she was up in the Zambezi Valley and it took Raoul and his team at that time to, is it, has it changed her? Okay. It took Raoul and his team two weeks to actually locate her and capture her. They, they were responding to a report of some spore was seen some time ago in this place. Um, and so two, two weeks of searching is a long time to be looking for one animal. Um, but as you'll see later on, uh, it's a two weeks very well spent. And it's the sort of effort that you do need to be making if you're going to achieve effective rhino um, conservation. Um, as as Ra was saying, the situation over time sadly changed. Um, and post 2000, um, la the land redistribution program um, impacted on the conservancies. And so places like Bubiana, which had previously been for wildlife conservation, were being converted to subsistence farming. Um, I still want to talk about that one back there a little bit for more first round. Um, so I'm still back on the Siabua slide. So in 2001, a monitoring of um, just during routine monitoring, the, the patrols picked up that Siabua was actually limping very badly on her front legs and having to, and struggling to, to move around normally. So um, they called in a response, an emergency veterinary response was, was mounted and she was immobilized and was, she was found to have two penetrating wounds in her, her leg and her shoulder. Um, they're probably caused by a small caliber bullet, something like a 2-2, um, which is relatively easy to get access to. A bullet like that's not going to kill the rhino on impact, but it is capable, especially in a knee joint shot like she had, is to you know, cause infection and slowly immobilize the rhino to the point that she actually can't move around enough to feed and would die of starvation. And, and then they'd be able to get the horns. Fortunately, with treatment, she made a full recovery. Um, and, and went on living quite well. Unfortunately, though, the security situation in the Conservancy continued to deteriorate, 
And by 2008, um, she had to be translocated from Bubiana into Bubi Valley Conservancy, where the security was relatively better. Um, and that's it. onto the, um, the next one, I think, Raoul, sorry. Um, sorry, I do want to talk a bit more about, as, as we were moving her across the 2008 and 2009, that was towards the end of those translocations out, out of Bubiana. And that's when we started to see some really interesting things with their social behavior. Um, Siabu was moved with five other close neighbors. And when she'd settled in Booby Valley Conservancy, we found that she'd actually settled with those five other animals had settled around her as well, even though there were a hundred other rhinos in the conservancy at that time. So they were, even though they'd moved areas, they had got back together socially. Um, and that was something we actually started looking for and could see it time and time again in what had happened is those animals had regrouped to who they'd been living with prior. This animal here um, is Millie. She came, she was also one of the founders into Booby Valley Conservancy. Sadly, she came through being an orphan. Um, Savi Valley suffered from many of the same um, problems that Bubiana and parts of Booby Valley were suffering from with those changes in land use and they were getting agriculture mixed in with the wildlife and, and poaching had started to escalate. Um, this was a cyanide poisoning of a waterhole. Um, rhinos were drinking there along with livestock. Fortunately, the monitoring picked up very quickly on the day that this animal died and they were able to rescue the calf before nightfall. Um, but just before nightfall, we can see where she was being moved overnight. Um, she was only four months old four months old at the time, and she was put into a hand-raising facility. Um, she proved to be incredibly challenging. We, we could not get her to drink milk, um, and she was, she was throwing herself against and pushing against the sides of the boma walls, so much so that she actually knocked off her front horn. You can see in that lower photo, she doesn't actually have a front horn on her. Um, and we were coming in, becoming incredibly distressed that we were going to lose this rhino simply because we couldn't get her to drink. And at the end of one of our attempts to, to try and force her to, to take a bottle, we sat down just completely dejected in her pen, trying to work out what on earth we were going to do to get this calf to feed. And as we were sitting there discussing that, she came up to us, crawled into our laps and actually sat down on top of us against our bodies and then started taking the bottle. Um, and she's just proved herself to be just a very emotionally sensitive and gentle rhino. And she just likes everything to be calm. And we had no problems from then. She took the bottle without any problems whatsoever. She was raised with two other rhino, four other rhinos, actually, another female and two other males. Um, and she was always the peacekeeper in that group. Whenever there was any pushing or shoving, she would always intervene. Millie has been released now for 13 years. She's continued to live next door to the other female that she was hand raised with in the pins. This photo was taken in 2001. That's Millie at the front. The calf behind her is a 2020 calf. The other one is a 2018 calf. And the one at the very back is her 2016 calf. She has since had another calf. She had a calf last year. So Millie has now contributed four additional rhinos to the conservancy um, post her, her very challenging beginning. Next one, please, uh, when you're ready. This little girl is Lisa Marie. Sadly, she was also impacted by, by poaching. Um, uh, the, uh, the biggest poaching problem we had early on with the, the conservancies post 2000 was actually snaring, as Raoul showed you the photo of Lemco. But the, those steel wire snares, you know, generally form just a physical injury. And if you take the wire off, um, the animal heals quite quickly. This little girl was actually snared with a copper wire snare. And copper has a, a chemical reaction with, this, with the tissue, with the blood, and, will, and actually starts to chemically eat through the flesh. So this wound was actually all the way down to the tendons. Um, and on a nine month old animal, that was, she was, you know, limping. That's very young and very debilitated to have left in the wild. So we had to capture her into pens and it took five months of daily treatment to heal that wound over to this point where, where the skin is actually rejoined. Um, and she was also, she fully recovered. It was another year and a half before she was big enough to put back out into the wild. Um, but she's been released now for 
I think she's all been out for about 12, 13 years also. Um, from, from, that's from, from memory. Um, but you'll see this, the, the next photo is her just just April this year. Um, and that's that was her, that's her now. You can barely see on the, her back right leg there, there is a tiny, you, you really need to know that she had an injury there and look for it to see that she has an injury. You, you can't see it in the shape of her leg anymore. You can't even tell she's got that scar. And this is her with her fifth calf so far that she's had in Bubi Valley Conservancy. Mabuya is the next animal I want to speak to you about. She was one of the 30 rhinos that we rescued out of Gorlais, um, which was a property north of um, Bulawayo that was heavily impacted by the land reform um, program. Um, when, she, when we captured her, we were when we did the immobilization, the first immobilization, we were drilling into her horn to put a, a transmitter in it so that she would be easily monitorable. And the dr drill bit went into an AK bullet that was lodged inside her horn. So that was quite a close call for, for her having, having that in her head. We, we did find another, a number of carcasses there um, that had been poached in that area. You can also see on her neck, there's scarring marks there. That is from a snare, a, probably a mining cable snare. It was a mining area. So they make the snares out of the mining cable, which is about as thick as your thumb. It's very heavy duty and causes major injuries. Fortunately, that snare had obviously fallen off instead of getting tighter and actually um, uh, kill, potentially killing her as it affects their throat. Um, she, she was moved into Booby Valley Conservancy and, and did well. And then some years later, she was found walking in circles, completely disorientated um, and in a very distressed state. Um, and she had actually lost her vision in, in both eyes. She had actually been shot in the head by poachers and one eye had been physically destroyed and the other eye was severely um, ulcerated uh, and infected. So she had to be captured and put into bomas, um, but she couldn't see, she couldn't smell, but she fortunately did maintain it. And it's all a very stressful um, process getting them used to bomas. But fortunately she did have an astounding appetite. Um, and we fortunately knew from her monitoring records, she, we had good old records on her. We knew that she was very soon to have a new calf. So she was really eating for two. Um, and it, she was taking, she, she gave me the biggest workout of my life. I think I had the biggest biceps I've ever had after feeding her for three months because she refused to take lucerne. She refused to take cubes. She just liked her natural food and it all had to be fresh cut trees. Um, but fortunately, that, that high food motivation from her was what made, was, also made it possible for me to make friends with her. She's not particularly fond of humans, understandably, given her history, but she does like her food. So as long as I was offering her nice, tasty, special morsels of food, she would present her head for me so that I could put eye drops in the one eye that was ulcerated. And we were hoping to be able to cure the infection and, and get her some sight back. Um, and we did that for, it was two months of, twice daily eye drops. Sadly, she never regained her sight. Um, and we, we decided that she was a robust enough animal and young enough, she's only in her teens, um, that we should give her a try um, at making it out in the wild. So we released her um, back out into, into the wild. And she has gone on to have a, a, a calf and completely blind. She's obviously adapted to being in the, um, getting, making her way around and, um, without seeing um, and raise that calf successfully. And that's her seventh calf that she's pr um, produced in this population. The, the young calf that was born in the Bomas, the little boy that she had there, it's very difficult for black rhinos. They very rarely succeed when they've given birth with raising a calf when they've had them in the Boma. And obviously we've been blind. And, and at that time she had the, the infection, very difficult. And he developed chronic diarrhea. Um, and so we decided that we needed to pull him at just 10 days old because we had to treat him um, and hence his name Squirt. And he really struggled with the whole process, being put into hand raising at such a young age, having that debilitation very young. Um, we've, been, we've put him out into the wild. He's, got in, he's had fights. We've had to put him back into captivity, put him back out and he doesn't succeed again, and we've put him back in. 
Um, and I, I must admit, I've practically lost count of how many times we've had to bring him back into the, into the captive setting to help him recover before we can put him back out. In this particular photo here, he's, he's not actually dead. He damn well looks it and he was close to it. He was now unable to stand up. He'd been injured and he was just debilitated and tired and essentially I think he'd just emotionally given up. Um, and so he wasn't able to stand. We had to, he could stand once he was standing, but he couldn't get up himself. So we put him back into pens and every four hours we lifted him up so that he would stand and then he would, you know, walk around for a bit and feed and then lie down again and we'd have to help him up. After two weeks, he was able to stand again by himself. And once he gained, he gained enough strength, we put him back out. He's now been out, I think, for four years. Um, he's nine years old now. Um, just two days ago in his area, we found this tiny, tiny calf spore. Um, and we believe that to be his second child that he has sired. Um, so it, it is quite an achievement to have an animal that had such a rough beginning um, to be actually be in a breeding situation. Um, if you go to the next side, oh, it'd be a girl called Diniwe. Diniwe was one of the first black rhinos we moved out of Bubiana into Bubi Valley um, back in 2002. Um, this photo is just from two months ago, and this is our first recording of what is her ninth calf. It's a nice little girl as well. Um, Siabua, sorry, Din, Diniwe is actually Siabua's first calf. So the girl that was captured alone up in the Zambezi Valley back in 1992, the mother here is actually her first calf. I'd like to go over to, to Siabua and discuss her in the next slide. Siabu has been a, a fabulous animal in these populations, and she has had 10 calves. I'm sorry, I think the bottom of the, the totals are at the bottom of the screen there, and it might be cut off for some of you by the title bar. Um, but she produced 10 calves. Those 10 calves produced, have produced 28 grand calves. From those 28 grand calves, we're currently at 11 great grand calves, and we even have one great great grand calf produced. So that's 50 additional animals into this population from just this one individual. Um, and it's a, a, you know, a remarkable contribution to, to rhino conservation by any standards. Sadly, though, as time marches on, not all of these animals are with us still. And this year, in two, um, 2023, Siabu turned 39 years old. This is a photo from her in February this year. A beautiful old girl. Um, but just a couple of weeks ago, um, the monitoring unit was tracking her grandson, Manjolo, and as they were tracking his spore, he took them to her carcass. Um, she had died a couple of weeks prior from old age. Um, and it, it is actually something we see not infrequently is um, live rhinos going to visit dead rhinos. Um, and they can sometimes do it depending on how closely related or how friendly they are. They can do that for years after the, the other rhino has passed away. Sadly, poaching and predation has um, taken other members of this family away. Um, and our current total living from this, this particular individual cow is 22 rhinos, which is still quite a significant um, contribution to conservation. We keep family trees like this for all of the rhinos in our population, um, in the black rhino population. That listing, the total listing currently has, what is it, it's 524 individuals documented in this population since it was started in 2020, uh, yeah, 20, sorry, 2002. Our current living population out of that is, is 218. Um, oh, I think we seem to jump, have jumped one slide there, Ralph. Maybe if you can just go back or to just a little bit more. So um, Siabua's last calf, Siadindi, was one of the 15 black rhinos that we translocated to Gonorizo National Park in 2021. Um, in that translocation, we were using the same Mercedes translocation truck that was used to move Siabua um, from the Zambezi Valley down to Bubiana in, back in 1992. Um, obviously, we hope with the, that we get the support we um, need from, from time to time. We're hoping that Siabua will be to Gonorizo what Siabua has been to this population, a significant contributor to rhino conservation. 
Thank you. Thank you um, very much for your time, your interest, and also for your contributions. Greatly appreciated. Raoul and Natasha, thank you both so much. That really was um, a fascinating and very detailed and insightful um, tale of the big picture and the individual rhino stories um, uh, coming out of all your amazing hard work in Zimbabwe. Um, we have a number of questions already in the chat for you. And if people have more questions, please do jump in and add yours. Um, so our first one here is for Raoul. It's from Tim Holmes. Great to see you, Tim. Lovely to have you here. Um, you'll see Tim has flagged that you gave a fascinating explanation of genetic drift, which, which I agree with. The, the alphabet soup analogy works very well. Um, Raoul, can you um, explain in terms of the, the different populations of black rhino in Zimbabwe at the moment, how the numbers of those existing populations help you add up to get to the, the target population that you were talking about? Sure. Well, we've been very lucky that um, in scavenging up these rhinos from different areas to put particularly into Booby Valley, uh, we have sampled a number of uh, you know different families of rhinos, put it that way. And when we talk about rhinos, moving rhinos from the Zambezi Valley, for instance, the Zambezi Valley is a big area that extends right a, along from the Mozambique border to the Botswana border, basically. And um, we move rhinos from different parts of that area. So we have managed to achieve a very high genetic diversity in Booby Valley. In fact, it's been proven through the genetic analysis that we've done to have the highest current diversity of any population in, in Southern Africa. Um, but we need to get those animals now in turn to interact with other rhinos by shuffling them around. Um, the, the general rule is that even with a large population of, of 100 rhinos or more, you need to bring in one effective founder every generation. And that's enough to counter the effects of genetic drift. And that's been happening de facto anyway because of what we've been talking about is picking up an orphan calf somewhere and putting it in the valley. But the other populations in Bali which aren't in that situation, we do have terrible inbreeding situations, particularly with the white rhinos. It's important to keep white rhinos in some small parks like Matoba, Kyle, those people know Zimbabwe, Chivera, et cetera, because these are areas where they're important for recreation and for public awareness. But we desperately need a rhino metapopulation plan for Zimbabwe. So we've been working on that this year, looking towards long-term options of restocking white rhino into Wanky National Park and black rhino into the Zambezi Valley and what the challenges and opportunities in doing that would be and in the short term, how we can go about shuffling rhinos around, uh, reorganizing rhino populations mm -hmm. to stop this inbreeding problem. Because having six rhinos here and seven rhinos there and eight rhinos somewhere else is just not cutting it. And it's time people woke up to that reality. So we're hoping to, to have a plan on that later this year, a very overdue plan. Thanks, Raoul. And, and I suspect what Tim may also be curious about here, I'm not sure whether you can tell us, um, but in terms of your target of 500, if you add up all the different black rhino populations, um, in, particularly in the low felt or across Zim, um, are you close to your target? Can you tell us how many you have altogether? Absolutely. Natasha, maybe you, you did the addition the other day. Yeah, I think we're, we're just over 600 nationally. Um, so, but but you've got to you know you've got to be managing the big low felt populations, and that's where most of the rhinos are in this situation. Um, you know, have got that good bank of, of genetics in them. There are smaller populations outside of that out, outside of the, the low felt um, that need to be part of a better management system. Thank you, Tim. I hope that answers your question. Um, over to a query from Lucy now, which I think is actually linked. Um, Raul, Lucy refers to your graph um, showing that the rhino population would have declined due to the intense poaching, if even if they'd been achieving the, the usual target of a population growth rate of 5%. Are you able to share what was the actual growth rate that that population was the, showing that would have allowed them to grow despite the poaching? And, and what, do you aim for 5% or do you aim for above that? No, we definitely aim for above that. We were looking at like 10% biological growth rate. And, and maybe Natasha could comment a bit on what that meant in terms of 
ages at first calving compared to other populations and intercalving interval as well. Yeah. Ralph's correct. Bi biological about ten percent. Some, sometimes these populations can can actually reach higher than that. Um, particularly very well settled ones like what we have here, because when they're socially settled, they're more comfortable with with who they're breeding with. Um, and also we've got very good food here, so they grow nice and quickly. So in in many cases, we're having first calves as young as five instead of the seven year age, um, you know, for that's standard for the species. Um, we're often having interval, inter calving intervals of just two years, whereas normally it's you're looking at two and a half years for those intercalving intervals. And so when, when your populations are performing like that, um, you can reach those 12 and 14 percent. Um, and, and that makes a big difference, particularly when you're having high poaching off dates, um, mm. really performing breeding wise as well as we have been here, um, we would have gone into significant decline. Thank you both. Um, we have a question come through from Emma, who's watching on Facebook. Um, I think this probably is a question for you, Natasha. I know you described a little bit about monitoring um, at the beginning, but Emma's wondering, um, with, with calves like Millie, where, where there's a calf with a problem, how do you keep track of the rhinos and, and monitor individual females so that you can support calves as quickly as possible when there is a problem? Um, well, with all those, so, so in those, most of those problem situations are normally through poaching. You've had, you've had some poaching event, uh, like, like the one with Millie was actually in the community. The community actually reported to us very quickly. Um, we actually, through, through a lot of that, even though there was a lot of snare poaching, we actually had very good community support for the rhinos. They weren't trying to injure rhinos. They were just trying to make their claim on land. Um, and people would make significant effort to come and report if they saw blood on a rhino or something like that. Um, in cases where it's shooting events, um, we work very closely with the anti-poaching departments. And so if there's been an incursion, um, we, will, we will follow up with them and check those areas. And, and normally you'll see some sign of behavior, like the guys, they know what rhinos are in their area. They know where they drink. And so by doing a check, you can quite quickly, you can work out, no, this, this is a problem. And they backtrack the spore as well from poaching. So um, they follow it all the way through to, to check if there's been any damage or not. And then we respond because obviously a place like Bibi Valley has a high, a large lion population. Um, any, any amount of time that that calf is out there, especially with its mother being a very big source of food, it attracts a lot of lions very quickly. Um, and so predation becomes your next risk. Absolutely. No, absolutely. Leave, leave no rhino behind. Um, I see we have another question here. I think it might be from Anthony in the chat um, about the role of the Zimbabwe government. Um, well, I think you spoke about the national plan. I know there are national rhino ops meetings and coordination. Um, I don't know if you want to chat briefly to respond to that question? Well, obviously Zimbabwe has been through a lot of economic and political chaos. That, and, and that in turn is reflected in reduced tourism to the country. Um, and that in turn means that our National Wildlife Agency um, is, is in a pretty poor state financially and, and does, just doesn't have the resources to, to do very much. Um, and a, another consequence, of course, of the uh, political and economic problems here has been a brain drain of competent professionals from out of the country. So the, the capacity, both financial and professional capacity in our National Parks Authority is, is very limited. And the, and the important thing has been that in recognition of that, the Parks Authority has become involved in several co-management arrangements. For instance, moving those rhinos to Ghana Resort National Park was entirely dependent on the fact that um, Frank Putsu Logical Society and, and other donors had invested significant support into Ghana Resort under a co-management arrangement that brought in the resources and the professional management to be able to start a restocking program there in 2021 after a number of years of preparation. Um, there will be further such exercises, for instance, African Parks are managing Matissadona National Park now, and I think that's probably going to be well, definitely going to be the first restocking option for, for black rhinos back into the Zambezi Valley 
um, you know, in, in due course when they also have got their themselves organized with all the preparatory work, both in terms of, of training staff and doing the feasibility studies and building the infrastructure to, to support run and restocking. But the, the Wildlife Authority, although it does maintain the overall, uh, let's say, management authority for rhinos in the country, it does not have management capacity, which is why we have to do things like the rhino translocations in countries like South Africa, for instance, your, your South Africa Black Rhino Range Expansion Project. I think you could re rely very heavily on provincial or state um, resources and professionalism and capture units, et cetera. We can't. We have to do it ourselves. Um, and um, it, it's quite a challenge, but at least um, we've reached the stage now where I think there's a recognition of the importance of these populations and uh, the fact that we're just allowed to get on with it to a large extent, but subject to annual permits and approvals. And uh, there, there are many, many issues. Um, I mean, just using aircraft, for instance, in this country, subject to lots of lots of controls and problems and delays that can sometimes affect emergency reactions. But things get done, and one finds a way to work the system. And um, we do have, um, at a planning level, I would say, adequate collaboration with national parks. Great. Um, thanks, Raoul. Um, so I see we have an, another question from Facebook um, about how AI can work on rhinos. Um, I'm not sure whether whether that's linked to, to camera traps and identifying um, rhinos from images or... Um, talking about artificial intelligence or artificial insemination. I'm not sure. Jen Jennifer on Facebook, maybe you could chat a bit more to your detail, a bit more detail into your question on the chat and we can come back to that one for you. Um, uh, in the meantime, I see Lucy had a, another follow-up question um, around intercarving, like how come these population growth rates are so high? How come your intercarving intervals are shorter? Um, do you know why this is? Which I think is a great maybe, question. Maybe I'll answer that one, Rao. Um, it's, it, it is related to, in this population, we're very low density with very good food. So there's no nutritional limitations on these animals. Um, you know, with, with, the, with the age at first calving being quite young, you know, they're reaching a good body size quite quickly um, because body size is one of the factors in it. Um, and, and also they just, they know the animals they're around. So they're comfortable with mating more quickly. Um, and so like, you know, a lot of our, um, well, we've got a good number of animals that are actually mating before they even turn um, four, um, three even, because they're having, some of them have had them in their first calf when they turn five. Um, and, and we've actually even seen a 15 month intercarving interval, which means that that cow gave birth and was happy to let a bull come back around her, even with an infant, infant calf and, and happy for that bull to mate. And that just speaks to how much they, they know and trust each other. They're dealing with regular animals. They're not being disrupted. They're not having bulls taken out and new bulls come in or being moved. You know, they're, they're, they're the, and that's what adds challenges to metapopulation management is moving them around is really socially disruptive for them and does um, hinder the breeding. You know, a, a female can, can refuse to mate um, and then you don't actually, you can miss a calf completely because she just doesn't know that bull. Mm. I hope that answers your question. Yeah. I think that does, and I, you know, I think the the phenomenal amount of information that you guys have on individual rhinos from all your sightings gives you this um, incredible in depth understanding of their their social interactions in a way that isn't known from many other places. I think you know that from yeah, yeah. My, I think we've... from my research that you know understanding food and nutrition is important, but some fascinating new insights that you've had there. Yeah. Yeah, we've been very very fortunate in that regard. And also just such a long history of it. Um, gives you that long-term data, which is so valuable. So maybe an, another quick question for you, Natasha. You you mentioned that um, Mabuya is, the rhino Mabuya is completely blind now. I know rhinos don't have great eyesight, but have you picked up any ways in which, in which that impacts her or...? How does she cope if she can't see? I mean, you know, there, there is the initial time, because we had to put her into an environment that she hadn't been in before we were releasing her into a new area. 
she had to build a new map for herself, which which was a challenge. Um, but you know, they've got incredible senses of smell and hearing. Um, and when you think about it, they're primarily active at night anyway. So they're, they're you know, and it's they're, so they're not really a high vision animal. So she was, she would, they use the blind animals. We have another cow as well, who's also 100% blind, um, living wild. Um, and they both, they, they do tend to use roads quite a bit, you know, when they, they can smell and get on a track and that helps them get from, from where they are to where they want to be. Um, uh, one of the things that Mabuya did initially, because, you know, if you, you want to smell water, but you've got to be downwind of it if you're going to smell it. And if you're upwind, you're now caught out. But the water points here have control boxes, which with like ball valves. So when the water is going into the water tank, it's going. And so she would just listen out. Ah. I've seen, saw her a few times. She just like, listen, it's like, ah, it's over there. And she would go straight to the control box. And once she was at the control box, then from there, she could quickly work out where the actual water was. Um, and so they, they just, you know, they use their sense of smell um, and, they, and their hearing um, incredibly. Their sense of smell, I, I think, is beyond what we can really imagine. Um, you know, even, even in the bomers, you could see them. They had their favourite foods. You'd put food in and you know they can't see it, but they would go straight for, the, for something they liked. And they were just smelling it every time. I mean, yeah, amazing. I think a lot of people underestimate just how smart and social um, and yeah. interesting these animals really are. Yeah. Um, so we, we have an update from Facebook. The question is around artificial insemination. I'm not sure whether either of you would like to talk about rhinos and artificial insemination. Well, they do it pretty well by themselves is what we've found. Um, <laughs> You're not, you're not going to really, when you've got them in a good situation, you're not actually going to be able to beat what they're doing. You know, their problem is not, is not make, um, achieving conception. Um, they're actually very good at that. So there, there's really not a need for it in these contexts. Um, they're, very, they're very capable breeders. So I, I think some of the, some of the rhino species, um, certainly the, the northern white rhinos, which very sadly is now down to just two females now. Um, you know, I believe there are more oh. intervention efforts being made for the other species. But as you say, um, because you still have these large populations, it, it's not a priority in your landscape. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the Northern Whites are a very different um, situation, sadly. Um, and there's, a, there's another question in the chat here around genetics and, and swapping animals with other reserves to, to ensure um, greater genetic diversity, suggesting uh, this may be the case in Malawi. Um, and yes, I can confirm that there, there were moves a few years ago um, of rhinos from South Africa to Luwandi in Malawi and um, between the, the rhino populations in Nwandi and Majeti in Malawi for genetic reasons. Um, Raoul, I think you did touch on this a little bit earlier, but any more? Um, and as I think you said, you know, because you've had to do so many emergency interventions in, in Zimbabwe, you haven't yet really been at a point where you've done interventions just for genetic purposes. Is that correct? That is correct. Although I also said it's, it's very overdue that we should be doing some interventions purely for genetic purposes. I mean, the, the one we did do was moving a rhino from a small property at Victoria Falls up to North Kawangu in Zambia. In fact, we moved two rhinos. But um, it's this balance, we've, as we've explained. Um, it's, it's very hard to um, just pick up a rhino from one area and go and dump it in another area and expect mm -hmm. it's going to fit in there. So it's a delicate balance between, on the one hand, recognizing the, the reality that the, of genetic management being required but on the other hand, managing that in a way that um, doesn't result in some, some translocation disaster. And that will often mean um, thinking very carefully about which animals you're moving. It may seem that the logical thing is just to move a bull, for instance, a young bull who can kind of take care of himself. But you may be better off moving a cow and a calf uh, into the other population to add the genetic diversity that way. So, you know, the situations have to be looked at very critically in terms of what the uh, what the recipient population is comprised of and what animals you can best send there um, and it does need a, a proper plan. Mm. Yes, yes, and I think that balance between um, 
the, the social, the genetic, the demographics, it really is a fine balance to, to um, play off the different costs and benefits when making some of these decisions. All right. Um, another question here about um, the orphans, um, the, the hand-reared um, rhinos, Natasha. It seems as though some of them do really well um, and they release back into the population and once they're out, they have many calves and are, are really productive, um, but perhaps others do not. Um, have you been able to tease out what some of the reasons behind that might be? We, th we think a lot of it has to do with their social bonding. Um, they are very social animals and, and our greatest success has been We've been raising those calves together in groups and, and minimizing their human habituation so that, you know, humans are very much bounded off. We, you know, we don't, unless you really have to, we don't go into the pens. Feeding is done at one set place. Um, it's done by regular people. It's, it's, um, it's very disciplined. And so the rhinos are very much raised with the objective of putting them back out in the wild and raising them, you know, having more than one, so they're bonded to each other. When you put them back out, they've got that company to help them too. Um, and it's, it's very, especially a young animal, it's very difficult to, to put a single animal back out into a population because now they're on their own and they've got to deal with mm. all the scary big owners. And I tell you, you know, those big ones are very scary. Whereas yes. if you're um, you know, you've you've got just you've got a little bit of edge because you're two and they're only one, and you've got that that backing up of ha of having a partner, um, and that has been a really big factor. That you know, also just really minimising that habituation. Um, we have seen it with Squirt, the the boy that needed to go back into hand raising repeatedly because he was injured and so unwell. He did need a lot of handling, and he did become bonded to people. And when he was, when he had any problem in the bush, straight away he was back to people. That's uh, where he mm. company comfort. And you know, that's you know, once once they're one ton of rhinoceros, you do not want that thing, you know, trying to get into your house or whatever. I mean, these these animals were never raised in houses. Um, they're in a pen structure and it's very disciplined. But even having them around your buildings, um, you know, is a recipe for disaster. Um, so. Discipline is really important as well. Absolutely, no, really fascinating stuff. Really very interesting indeed. Um, I wonder if there are any other questions from the floor or from Facebook for Raul and Natasha to follow up on these fantastic stories. Oh. Um, if, Ah, okay, we, we have another question popped in the chat here about poisoning of water holes. Yeah. Um, do you deal with... For, fortunately, it's very rare. Um, so that's one blessing. Um, that particular water hole, they had to fill it in. They put brush around it, thorny brush, acacia, initially to stop it, um, any other animals getting in to drink at it. And then they actually had to, to fill it in with dirt um, because I don't know, I don't, I don't think it's actually treated anymore, is my understanding, hey? You can't treat cyanide. Mm. No, not really. You just have to wait for it to dissipate. But I think it's just worth touching on one other issue that arises from that situation. Um, there is often a, a, a feeling that um, the, the poaching is driven by, by the poverty of local people. Um, whereas in, in reality, in, in a place like the Lofeld, the poaching is perpetrated by highly mobile gangs who Will, will come from outside that area um, and a bit like bank robbers will, will hit, you know, whatever targets they can hit. Um, and in that situation, they actually poisoned the local people's cattle in the course mm. of doing that cyanide. Mm. So the local people were thoroughly fed up with that. And, and it just points to the fact that there are a number of cliches or myths in rhino conservation, a lot of them perpetrated from the experience around Kruger National Park, to be honest, where I think the communities are alienated and where there's a Robin Hood element in terms of the contribution that poachers will make back to their communities from the proceeds from their poaching. But it doesn't apply universally. And, and we, we do find that it is possible to cultivate, as Natasha said earlier, a strong degree of community goodwill through awareness programs 
they are not the source of the poachers. Yes, thanks, thanks, Raoul. And I think um, even in South Africa, where it's becoming more clear, actually, the, the damaging effect that the embedded nature of organized crime and the, the flow of illicit money into these societies that it's um, actually very can be very damaging for people as, as well as for the wildlife. Um, yeah. I think we have one last question in the chat. Um, again, I think this is Anthony. And Raoul, I, I think I know your answer to this question, and I, I may add to it. Um, has there, Anthony's asking, have there been any translocations of individual rhinos with South Africa? Or into South Africa? Well, I, I, was, I think just broadly between South Africa and Zimbabwe, perhaps you'd like to talk a little bit about it. He's talking about blacks. Yeah. Well, well, yes, I mean, um, while I touched on genetic issues, I didn't get into some of the complications, but one of the populations in the low felt, the Malangwe population, was founded totally from rhinos from South Africa because um, there was invest in Malangwe. We want to get on with having rhinos, um, and they preferred to have a situation of ownership of the rhinos by buying those rhinos, 27 of them in South Africa, and bring them to Zimbabwe. Um, and paying the duty, et cetera. So they, they've got control and ownership. That does introduce some genetic complications which are not insurmountable, but but yes, so that those rhinos came in here. Um, Zimbabwe years ago allocated black rhinos to Kruger National Park and to Swaziland. And certainly the, the black rhinos from Zimbabwe into Kruger have been shown through recent genetic research to have contributed disproportionately, both genetically and demographically to that population showing that um, it is important to infuse these animals in. So as part of this metapopulation planning we're talking about, we'd very much like to look at um, how we can go about doing some transfer rhinos, less so from South Africa to here, because we've got very high genetic diversity here already, but from Zimbabwe to South Africa. And unfortunately, Joe, you bailed out of breath, so we have to talk to somebody else now. <laughs> but uh, we need to do that. From a white rhino point of view, there's also ongoing... Uh, transfers that have happened, uh, or not so much in recent years, but obviously what's been happening in terms of the availability or potential availability of white rhinos from from John Hume's uh, semi-captive herd raises a lot of interest in how that might result in a flow of, of white rhinos to adequately secure areas, not just in South Africa, but in the region. So we're very mindful of those opportunities, and we would very much like to see some some collaboration across the border and we will work towards that. Absolutely. Yes. Yes. Thanks, Raoul. I think you're referring there to the, the Black Rhino Range Expansion Project um, with WWF South Africa, which uh, was part of my previous life. And I know that Dr. Jacques Fremont, who leads that project, has um, very successfully created 15 new Black Rhino populations over the last 20 years. Um, and still has a, an ongoing goal to try and bring in some animals from Zimbabwe to, to add to the genetic diversity of that metapopulation. population. That's an, an ongoing goal for us all. I see there's a, there is another question in the chat about demand. I think we could talk for another, um, another hour and a half about demand for rhino horn and what's going on. And there is, uh, Emma's kindly shared a link with some information on that um, into the chat. There does, uh, there do seem to be kind of ongoing shifts in terms of who is buying rhino horn and where and why, how much they're paying for it. Um, reports perhaps now that it's being more used more as an investment piece, um, more use uh, as ornamental beads or bangles. Um, so, you know, more work constantly needing to be done to really understand who is buying horn and, and why in order to be able to influence that. Um, but it does seem as though there is increasingly positive collaboration between some governments. I think particularly the Chinese governments um, are taking the illegal use of horn increasingly seriously and, and collaborating with conservation law enforcement um, officials in Africa on, in trying to address that. So. Um, Perhaps we'll have to put together a whole a whole other session on, on rhino horn demand soon. Yeah. Well, I think we seem to have 
answered the questions from our speakers today. So perhaps I will wrap up firstly by saying huge thanks to Raul and Natasha for um, all of your, your time and your inputs and all of your incredible work for black rhinos, for rhinos, particularly black rhinos in Zimbabwe. Um, thanks to all of the, the donors and partners who make this work possible. Um, and thanks to you for joining and for your interest in rhinos and in Save the Rhino. And please do tune in next month on Thursday, the 21st of September. We'll be doing our next event um, the evening before World Rhino Day to provide a global update on where we're at for rhinos around the world. Thanks, see you then.